All right, we got a, that's fine, whatever. Um, so basically, basic tools, go real quick, because I know you've probably got a whole bunch of background in this. Um, I just put together this PowerPoint over the last couple of days. I tried to hit on the things that kids need to know. Um, I don't teach machining. SIM is not a machining class. SIM is computer integrated manufacturing. So I kind of, I just want to touch on how to run a CNC machine, the basics of tooling, so then the tools that they're going to use. So what I did was I put what I thought has been important to me over the last 13 years in a SIM classroom and came up with uh, things that you might see um, throughout the curriculum. Uh, for instance, uh, types of tools. Uh, we talk about different types of tools. Um, I have one more picture to get in there, a picture of a, uh, um, a fly cutter. I've got to get back to school. I've been out of school for two days now due to snow. So the center cutting end mills are the ones that we use all the time to do mostly everything. If you need a flat bottom pocket uh, or if you need to plunge, uh, face milling, end milling, side milling, and they'll have two or more teeth. I think it's one of the most versatile tools in our library at, back at, at school for the, for the sim class especially. Uh, we use it for just about everything. Um, the non-center cutting end mills, I don't recommend. Do you guys, do you, either of you use non-center cutting end mills for anything? I have, but it wouldn't be for a part that we would be cutting here. Beautiful. All right, because I try to tell my kids we don't have any of these. And the reason I don't have any is because if I had a kid try to plunge with one of those, he's going to break my tool and his part. So I have I mean, only... Those are, those are very specific tools you would use for, like, I'll give you an example of how you might use that. Um, if, uh, well, for instance, I can tell you where I've used it before. Um, was punching holes through frame rails for fire trucks. Okay. For a mag drill. Okay, and we're not yeah. punching holes through fire trucks, so we don't have to worry about it. No, I mean, it's, it's a very specific tool. Usually those tips are carbide tips. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you're, you're controlling that mag drill very, very slowly. Um, it's set at a very specific speed. It's going, you know, your feed rate is, is really there because those things are tempered. So, mm -hmm. you know, you may be right at a temper line and... So you're, it's almost like cutting two dissimilar metals at the same time. And so it's useful for that. Right. We're not going to be doing any of that in Sim. So right. I basically I show them what they look like because they're going to might see a picture of one on the yeah. final exam. Yeah. And I say that I don't recommend them for the Sim Lab because they'll break easily if you accidentally use them to plunge. And everybody knows that high school kids would never do that. Um, no. One thing that's no, they better. One of the things that's big in the curriculum are ball end mills and that they're used for uh, surfacing, surface, uh, uh, doing different surfaces, complex surfaces. Uh, used for decorative edging, uh, like fluting or beads when you design your container. And they can have two or more teeth. Uh, here's an example of a, a complex surface that you might be able to do with a ball end mill. Uh, I talked about, I have kids that, that well, let's use a, a flat end mill to make a surface. And you really can't do that because you end up with some pretty deep ridges and it looks like gouges and you end up having to do a, a secondary uh, sanding or a, so some other secondary operation to actually get rid of all the ridges. So we really don't use the end mills for uh, surfaces. Um, step over is a term that the kids really need to know. If you have a surface like this that needs to be machined and if you use a quarter inch ball with a step over of 0.125 and 0.125 is the amount of the tool that's going to actually overlap as it goes around um, it ends up looking like this the blue lines are the, uh, the uh, cut lines the tool path when you take a half inch ball mill the 0.25 step over you see you have more ridges and it won't be nearly as smooth uh, actually fewer ridges, but they'll be deeper and won't be nearly as smooth. But if you take that step over and you change that step over to um, 0.125 inches instead, you end up with a smoother surface that looks sort of like the one with a quarter inch. The difference is that you can look at the different machine times. And machine time, when you have one milling machine in your classroom, I have, I'm lucky enough to have two, but if you only have one milling machine in your classroom and you've got all these people 
uh, that want to use it, they, they just line up behind it. And all of a sudden, a part that takes eight minutes and 49 seconds, you know, when two kids could do it in the same amount of time with time left over for a third, um, machine time tends to get pretty, uh, pretty important, um, especially for the kids as they're designing. Um, might end up even being part of your uh, parameters. When, I, when we do the container project, like we're going to do in a little bit, I tell the kids that you have to be below a certain amount of time, machine time, generally between 8 and 10 minutes per part. Otherwise, uh, they, we can't machine it. So, um, any questions so far? There's only really a couple other things in tooling. I will give you a copy of this. A lot of this I've gleaned from some Project Lead the Ways PowerPoints and clarified it a little bit and added to it. Um, for instance, another thing that students need to know about before they start using HSM is depth of cut. And depth of cut, for instance, in a pocket like this, this pocket's uh, uh, 0.75 inches deep. You want to cut it out in three passes or so or more passes because you don't want to cut all the way to the bottom. Uh, when you have a smaller machine like an Intellitech, um, you can't cut all the way to the bottom and, and hog it all out. Maybe on a bigger machine you might be able to. So depth of cut is important to us. Uh, so here's an example where you use a half inch end mill to hog all that out. Uh, you use a .25 depth of cut. And depth of cut generally, a good rule of thumb for the classroom, uh, would be half of whatever the diameter of your tool is. That would be a good uh, a good rule of thumb to start with. A fly cutter or a shell mill. I still got to get a have a to get a picture of that. Yeah, I really I don't have one for my uh, smaller machine, but I do have a big machine in the back, the manual mill that we use for facing operations, and we have a three inch fly cutter that we can use to do facing operations. Makes facing a lot faster. But that's kind of a specialty to uh, specialty tool also. Um, a lot of people like to engrave with their milling machines. I tend to stay away from it because it's a big time suck. It takes a lot of time to do. I would rather do the engraving on a laser cutter. So if you have a laser cutter, you can do all your engraving on that. If you don't, you can very easily use a pointed engraving tool like this to actually follow a path, a contour, or even pocket out this letter P on uh, this little example here. And these are just some different examples of engraving cutters, cutters that you can buy. Um, you, have to be, you have to use go very shallow cuts and do very sh uh, slow feed rates with them uh, because they tend to break uh, rather easily. Anybody, anybody here done any engraving with an engraving tool? Uh, I played with one the other day just in wax. Awesome. And wax is perfect. It works great. If it breaks anything, the wax breaks rather than the cutter generally. Awesome. Yeah, my dad, uh, he, he wants a little uh, plate engraved. He, he hand-built a guitar, so he wants a little oh, nice. engraved section on it. So I'm practicing in wax, and then I'm hoping to practice here soon in the wood, too. Very nice. Oh, that'll be awesome. Good luck with that. Yeah. Send a picture when you Thanks. get it. Thanks. Send a picture when you get it done. Uh, okay, I will. Um, We've got a specific engraver for engraving that's over at the, our uh, carpentry shop. Yeah? So, yeah. Yeah, we can just take things over there and put it in there as long as it fits inside the the 12 by 12 by 12, no, 12 by 12 by 2 uh, size. It'll, uh, and it's probably a go larger than a 2 inch depth. Uh, Excellent. I just know that that's the, that's the normal that they have it set for, and you can just set it over there and let it run. Beautiful. We don't We're even have to. And it'll actually take out of, uh, we found out, I guess it was last Friday, that it, w it we, all, we knew it would take directly from Inventor because we had run Inventor over there. We had actually literally sent an Inventor file to it, and it, it worked just fine. What we found out was uh, HSM goes right to it also. Awesome. We didn't have to do anything to the file, so it was. It actually, when we took it over there, we just took it over and gave it to them, and they just put it in the machine and zip, and we walked away. And they Great, did it. that's the best way to do it. So, one of the other types of special. Okay. 
one of the other types of specialty mills that I don't suggest using um, are roughing end mills. I mean, unless, of course, you're getting into heavy-duty uh, machining, but in the sim class, we really don't get to it. We're using wrench shape. Um, it's a roughing end mill, and it's used for hogging out a lot of material quickly. Um, with the wrench shape, uh, a regular end mill works just fine, and when you're doing mass productions, you're doing lots of parts with kids, um, using this, you then have to, after you rough everything out, you actually have to do a finish pass with a different tool, and that would include a tool change. And uh, a sim kid and tool changes, lots of things could go wrong, you know, the wrong tool, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I don't tend, tend to use these in the projects uh, because the wrench shape cuts really easy, the wax cuts really easy, wood cuts really easy without actually using um, a roughing end mill. Later on, or well, actually before this, when kids do speeds and feeds, um, sometimes Project Lead the Way will throw the term teeth at you, and sometimes they'll throw the term uh, flutes at you. And uh, kids ask, well, what's the difference? Well, actually, there really isn't. The, there, there's a tooth at the end of every flute. So if you have a two-tooth end mill, um, you'll have two flutes. If you have a four-tooth end mill, you'll have four flutes. So... Um, a gen good general rule of thumb is the harder the material you're cutting, the more teeth you need. Um, the fewer the teeth, the more space between them. That's called, it's called chip space. And if you're cutting aluminum, you'll find that uh, with more teeth, the tool tends to gum up faster. So uh, you're better off actually with a, uh, a two-tooth tool instead. Just make sure you get the right speeds and feeds. And with aluminum, you're going to find that speeds and feeds are critical because there's lots of different types of aluminum out there. Um, chip load, something that the kids need to hear the term, I feel, but really don't have to know much about calculating it, um, is the thickness of material shared away by each cutting tooth, called the feed per tooth, uh, or also it's called the, the, the chip load. Uh, the neat thing that I just found out when I did this PowerPoint yesterday was that the reason this is so important is because the chip carries away the heat from the milling process with it. So it's imperative for those chips to get out of there. I knew that because it wouldn't cut smoothly, but I didn't know that it was a, a big part of carrying the heat away from uh, the part. So the number of teeth is very important. But again, when we're working in ran shape and modeling materials, um, you can get by with the whole range on your machine, or you can set it to 5,000 RPM, which is the max on an Intellitech, and you can run any tool and get the, the feed right, and you're good to go. The machine will, will go on these, these, these uh, modeling materials very, very well. Um, and I think uh, cutting tool material, the difference between high-speed steel and carbide tipped, um, I do have one solid carbide tool because we were cutting wood uh, and we were doing lots of parts for uh, mass production. So the person who needed it done bought us the tool because our carbide tip and our high-speed steel tools were burning. They were burning the wood and then the tool would get burnt and hot and it wouldn't cut very well. So they bought us a solid carbide and that thing has cut. Yeah, I've had it for five, seven years and it just cuts all day long every day and doesn't complain, but they're very expensive. Um, I don't use high-speed steel anymore. I use mostly carbide tips uh, for all of the machining, and I do mostly wrench shape and some wood. Um, they need to know that there are some kind of coatings on some of the tools, because they'll say some gold ones. And Are they coated with gold? No, it's actually uh, it's titanium nitride uh, that makes it harder and gives it more heat resistance. It allows you to increase the speeds and feeds. Um, what's the difference between conventional versus climb? Um, what the kids need to know for this course is very minimal. Uh, here's a great picture that shows you an example of each. Uh, more chip space is necessary with saw, and I think what I have to do is I think I've got the wrong picture on the other, on this slide. So I'll change that picture out. But some of the questions that when a teacher asks me what tool should I use, um, center cutting end mills are the workhorse you can use for almost everything except surfaces. Surfaces are best cut using ball end mills. Um, change the step over for smoother finishes. The shorter the tool, the more rigid it will be. Uh, allow for greater accuracy and less chance of breakage. And 
I got to be honest, most of the projects we do in class, breakage is the bigger concern rather than the accuracy. Uh, but the more teeth, the smoother the finish. It calculates speeds and feeds. And that's really uh, for modeling materials. Keep that in mind. And the larger the tool, the more efficiently it will cut, meaning less machine time. So, for instance, if I had a humongous pocket, if I had a big pocket in the middle of something, um, I could hog that out with a half-inch end mill a lot faster than I could with a quarter-inch end mill. It just spend less time in the machine. Um, anybody? Hey, Nate, uh, saw you come in. We've got five people now. A uh, bunch of people. If you have any questions, feel free to, to stop. I thought, has anybody taken anything yet and put it into HSM that you've made an inventor and tried to machine it and had any success with it? Uh, just that that, that uh, engraving I did, uh, I modeled that on inventor and then ran it through HSM. Awesome. And what did you use in HSM? Did you use pockets? Did you use profiles? What did you use to do it? Uh, shoot, I forget what I did. A contour, maybe? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, I can't remember. I mean, I've gone through, I think, all but the last video um, that you have posted on your site for how to use HSM. So I've worked through all that. Excellent. Um, but th the only thing I've actually put in the mill was that was the engraving. Okay. When you uh, um, it just it just it just kind of traced the you know I, I did the text the text thing on uh, Inventor and it just kind of traced it. Good. So I, I guess that's contour, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Um, so I guess what I did, uh, what I wanted to show you today, and this doesn't have to go all the way until five o'clock, depending on how comfortable everybody is. But I want to leave some time for some questions and answers. But the the big project for Lesson 2.3 is uh, designing a container. And Jim went through, uh, Jim and I went through um, designing a container last time. So what I did was I took a bunch of my students' containers and I put them in a folder. I sipped it up and I sent it to everybody via email through, uh, through, the, through Canvas. So if you check your email, you'll see a zip folder of a bunch of different containers. Um, that comes with a caveat, though, too, and that is that those containers are designed by students, and they may not be the one that I tested. So you want, if, if you're going to pick one of these to use for your class, you might want to check the tolerances on them to make sure that the top and the bottom will fit perfectly, all right, because that's a big, uh, a big sticking point among the kids when they design their part, their lip and the lid, there's no space between them and they force them together and then they never come apart or they don't fit together one and two so <laughs> you end up with a, a bank that you have to cut a slot in but every year what I do is I have the kids each design their own container following the rules like we went over last time and then they we vote on all the kids the kids all design a container we vote and the one with the most votes is the one that we mass produce and every kid spends the time putting their part through um, Inventor and through HSM so that I've had three or four kids every year come to me and say, Mr. Hurd, can I make my part outside of class? Sure, of course you can. You know, you come in and, and you make the part, but for the most part, it ends up then being a mass production. Everybody gets the same container. So in 2013, this was Gonley's container. Um, Hers won the competition. This was the most popular, uh, and it looks something like this. Note, though, one of the rules that I put in when a kid makes a designs a round container, I make them put an index on it so that it only fits on one way. So if you look, you see there's a little um, bump right there, and corresponding on the other side, you'll have a negative or a cutout so that the flutes line up all the time. Um, so that's one of the, that was one of them. Uh, you can pick that one to play around with. Um, one year, Annika, she was a foreign exchange student. Um, I think because she was a foreign exchange student, I think that had something to do with the kids wanted her to win so that her container would uh, get chosen. It's a very simple one, and that's the one I picked to kind of uh, play with today because, A, it's a simple one, and i got to be honest with you, um, I'm teaching educator. I'm teaching uh, HSM next week, 
and this is all new to me too. Uh, Jim is the uh, guru when it comes to HSM. He's the one who's been playing with that for over a year now. I've been dabbling with it, you know, playing with it, doing this thing and that thing, but I've yet to design a container in it. So I spent the time this morning on my snow day because uh, we got another uh, 18 inches of snow today. Um, so we therefore did not have school. And I got to play with at, uh, HSM, and I did it without Jim's videos, and I cannot believe how amazingly easy it really was to actually do. Um, so here's your part. You make your part. Um, depending on the year, I'll make the, the boxes smaller if I have less material or more material. Um, if you want to check, uh, for instance, a kid comes up to you and says, hey, here's my, here's my part that I want to make. Um, is it going to work? And what I'll end up doing is I'll go to the inspect. I'll, I'll find what's the distance from one side to the other. And this happens to be exactly 2.5 inches. And then I'll roll this over. And I will check again. And I'll check the inside distance. And again, it's exactly 2.5 inches. That's a no-no. Uh, that top, that lid, will not fit on that top of that box. So right off the bat, as you're working in Inventor, um, and you're working along with this, unless you go in here and edit that and make the lid a couple thousandths bigger, uh, so what I would do is I would go in here and make this pocket uh, two thousandths bigger. And then it would fit just perfectly. Uh, but that happened. The kids do that all the time. They don't offset. They don't like to use the offset. They like to. They don't like to project the geometry and use offset. It's too complicated. Uh, but if they use the offset um, and project geometry, it works every time. So here's a container. And I learned quite a bit today when it comes to. You guys want to just run through this and uh, try to machine this and see what it comes out looking like. Sure, I have a quick question if you don't sure. mind. Sure, yeah, no, not at all. Um, so I'm just thinking of the material. I mean, this, I, I know you like to do it um, in one piece, flip it, and uh -huh. then saw the, the two things off. Um, how thick of a, a rim shape are you working with? Two inch thick. It comes in two inch thick. You two can inch. get it, yep, you can get it up okay. to two inches. So, if so you, that's all the thicker. So this really isn't that thick of a container. No, no. This is this holds a deck of cards. That particular year, the goal well, I gave them okay. the, the constraint. Hold, it has to hold a deck of cards. Okay. And okay. We, we don't do the we do surfaces on another project. So you see how skinny mm -hmm. the box is. It'd be really really hard to put a crazy surface on the top of that like Jim does. Um, so we don't do surfaces right. on this project. We do an inlay with a laser cutter. And we put a, an inlay on the top of it. So you can get away with a skinnier box that way. You could very easily break this into two parts mm -hmm. and machine both parts. Um, and even right. use a little bit thinner, use an inch and a half piece of material for each. And then you'd have a decent boss on each piece for the vise to hold on to. Mm -hmm. So that might be that might be a good way to uh, do it too. I, I just don't remember how thick my board is. And I'm... Um, Tempted to go ahead and buy some Rin shape. I think I have some budget for it, but I know I bought some MDF, and I just I don't okay. know if it's how thick it is. And I think I found around the shop some blocks that it looks like they just took MDF and must have just glued it together like four pieces thick. So yep. I didn't know if it was for this project, and I don't know if that would be a, a good way to go or a terrible way to go to just kind of make a laminate and then machine it. I have done that with wood before. We've done projects made out of wood. Okay. We've laminated wood together, and that works perfectly. Um, I wouldn't okay. use soft wood with knots. Um, some you can, okay. you can get some really nice birch plywood. Um, our wood okay. shop, our wood shop guy, um, he does a bandsaw box project with the kids, and I, he gave me the idea actually um, to save some money. Instead of using just hardwoods, he'll buy a sheet of um, birch plywood it's got to be a pretty high grade plywood but you get a four by eight sheet for I think he gets it for forty six dollars and the reason he uses that specific type of plywood is because there aren't any aren't any gaps in it um, as soon as you get like with pine 
Um, way back in the day, we were doing a project in Pine, and we were using a vacuum table to hold the part in place. And a kid hit a knot once, and the vacuum table sucked the knot out, breaking suction, and the part was <laughs> flying flying across the room. So, you know, so it's like that didn't work out so well. But with with hardwoods, so he, he, mm -hmm. or hardwoods or MDF, you can you can laminate that. It's as good as you know because you, you do it on a on a wood lathe. Uh, you laminate stuff all the time. That would work just fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I've never machined MDF before, but I'm I'm sure it'll work just as well. Uh, wood, you want to be careful of. Uh, you might want to go with a carbide tool if you can afford it, uh, because the carbide tools I found never burn. The Intellitex only rev up to about five thousand RPM, and that's really not fast enough to cut wood very very cleanly. Uh, that's why you use routers, okay. but I don't, I don't have a router, so I use an expensive tool instead. And Enco, Enco is where I go to get those, and that would probably work really well, I'd imagine. Okay. All right. So. Thanks. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one thing that I found uh, with doing HSM right in Inventor is that I can do both sides and post the code for both sides all at the same time, which is something I couldn't do in EdgeCam. So that's really kind of a bonus. Um, so what I started doing today is I started thinking of this as a process. So the first thing you do, you go into CAM, um, and I go to setup. And setup was super easy. A uh, couple things to remember, uh, Jim showed you, and you'll see this in all the tutorials. Uh, the first thing you want to do is move your PRZ to a corner that you're going to use when you machine it. I'm going to use this corner. Um, notice that my axes are all messed up now. My X has to be going across here. My Y has to be going across here. And it's really pretty easy to just come over here and say, I want to select my Z and my X axes. My Z axis um, is already right, so I'm going to leave it alone. The X axis, oops, there we go, good one. Go to setup, try that again. The Z is right, let's change the X. So we'll change the X to make it this axis, and then we'll flip it. And now we've got the Y going in the right direction, the X going in the right direction, and the Z going in the right direction. Um, make sure that you don't leave any extra stock around the outside edge. And, okay, the setup's done. It's, it's that easy. It's so much harder in edge cam. So we've got our setup all set. Uh, what do you guys want to do first? We're going to do the bottom of the box. What what operation you want to do first? You have any preferences? I got to be honest. You can do anything you want, and then once you have all your operations over here, you can swap your operations up and down. You can slide them up and down very easily. Um, anybody have any preferences of what we start with? Um, if not, I guess what we'll do is we'll do the pocket first. So I'll take a 2D pocket. We'll choose the bottom of the pocket, and that way, if we choose the bottom of the pocket, we won't have to uh, we won't have to select the depth or anything. Uh, well, something you need to make sure you do is change stock to leave to zero, so that it doesn't leave any for a finishing pass. We're going to do this all in one pass because it's ren shape, and we're trying to save some time. Uh, I want to pick a tool. The tool I'm going to choose is my largest in my project with the Y library, which is a half inch flat end mill. I'm going to select that tool. It chooses all your feeds and speeds for you. Um, I think I would ramp this up to about 5,000 5, RPM personally, uh, but it, that, that'll work just fine. And I can check if I wanted to change depths or I wanted to change where my clearance was, or my feed height or my retract height, I could come in here and I could change it. I'm not going to mess with it. And when I tell the kids, you know, if you don't know what these things are, don't mess with them. Let, let HSM figure it out, and let's see what happens the first time through. Um, the last tab is for lead-ins and lead-outs. You may want to mess with those later on. We're not going to worry about it right now. Let's just see what um, HSM does for us. We're going to say OK. And we notice it does a helical entry, goes all the way to the bottom of the hole, 
and then cuts out the whole thing in one big spiral and then comes out. Um, that wouldn't be so good on our IntelliTech. The IntelliTech would not like that. It, it wouldn't, um, that's a really deep cut uh, for a very small machine. So I'm going to go back in and edit that and I'm going to find where I can say I want to do multiple depths and the maximum roughing step down uh, since it's a half inch end mill I'm going to make my maximum step 0.25 which is half of the diameter of my tool that's a good rule of thumb that I use in my classroom and with wrench shape and modeling material that seems to work pretty well so we'll tell it only go a quarter of an inch deep at a time and you'll see it now makes three passes to get down into it so let's simulate it and see what it actually looks like turn on my simulation I'll speed this up a little bit and we see it does it in three passes boom all set a uh, really neat feature something else I figured out uh, once you get done with the simulation if it does what you wanted it to we can close it if I click on my pocket and I go to this last um, item under that pocket I can say uh, sh where is it machine time and it'll tell me it's going to take five minutes and 42 seconds to perform that operation so that's a really neat feature my kids will go in there and say oh you know what that's that's going to take too long I better use a different tool or um, I want a smoother finish I've got some time to play with uh, it's a really cool uh, really cool thing to look at um, so I've got my pocket now I want to do this outside edge back in edge cam I would have done this with a uh, profile I would have uh, contour I would have followed this edge all the way around and then I would have followed that edge around again but offset in the XY axis so it makes two passes to cut all this out and it would be very easy to do that um, but playing around today I found that if you chose a 2d pocket and I chose that surface what it does is it selects that edge as a boundary and will stay outside of it automatically so I just chose this as a pocket I'm using the same tool uh, my stock to leave make sure that you make it zero and multiple depths again I want to it's a half inch tool so I'm going to make this 0.25 which is half the diameter of my tool again uh, and I see this I'm like wait a minute what's that going to do well let's simulate it and find out and we can simulate these one at a time or we can select the whole thing let's just do it one at a time and it very nicely very easily goes around and does just what I need it to do now the question is is that enough it's left these little tabs you see the little tabs that are sticking up here um, the kids don't like that and so they'll go through and they'll do something else and they'll uh, do another profile around it to knock those off but in reality if you look the gray part is our actual box the blue part is not um, so that's all gonna get taken away anyway so let's just leave it and perform another operation on it to get rid of those as well we'll do it all in one uh, one fell swoop because they're very small tabs and it's just throw away anyway so we can close that now let's try a, a contour because what I want to do is I want to drag my tool around this outside edge and get that nice finish there so I'm going to select that edge to drag the tool around and I haven't changed my tool I'm still using my half inch end mill uh, which is why I really like this box there's no tool change and it went very very quickly um, I can say multiple depths and it's a little bit different this the 2d contour window is a little bit different so you have to make sure you get 0.25 and again it'll go down make its passes down this is the lead in and lead out that you see you can get rid of that if you want but it, it doesn't really matter uh, let's simulate that and see now, what happens go ahead question yeah it looks like it's going to end up going around 
um, material that would have actually already been removed. So is there a way in Heights to tell it to actually start lower? I mean, that yes. the operation you did right before this yes. you should have removed some of that already. You can. You can. And to do that, let's say close this. We can go into for this. Let's close that back up. That was this contour. We can reopen that contour. And we can go into Heights and we can play around with our clearance, our top, we've got top height, so the top height, the blue, we can take that and we can make that top offset, we can offset that top. Um, if I knew that was uh, 0.25 down, I could say minus 0.25, let's try that and see what happens. Mm, the feed height must be above the top, so then we'd have to change the feed height to, I'm just going to go with one inch. The retract height must be above the feed height. So let's make this 0.5 and see what we get. I think it'll now do just what we want it to. And what we'll do is we'll verify this at the end when the whole part's done. And we can also change the order of operations. Uh, did that do what we wanted it to? Let's see. Mm, no, it's still it's still taking a separate pass. Still taking a, another pass. I'll figure out how to do that, Nathan. And we'll we'll I'll let you know next week. Okay. Okay. But yes, yes, you can. You can pick. Um, I can. I'll, I'll mess around with that. And we'll see if we can't figure that one out. But now I've done. I, I do think for my. But I remember from the videos, there's some way to kind of link it to a previous operation. But I didn't yes. know if there was a way. Yes, there Just is. And, the heights, too. And Jim knows how to do that, and I do not right now. I'll figure that one out. <laughs> okay. Um, but, and again, too, when you get, when you start doing this I've with your it. class, when, yeah, I see, I remember seeing it, too, because I edited the, edited the videos. I just don't remember how to do it. So here's the, the, the question, too, though. Um, it's the night before you got to start running these in the classroom, and this is all I got. I got to be honest with you. The first year I ran it, I, I put the piece of material in the machine, and without any kids there, really early in the morning, I ran it, and it made so many moves in air that I didn't need, but it was a learning experience, you know. So if I had to run this, and it ran around there one time, I could even, hmm, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll change that in one second. But let's, let's try to verify this whole thing. To verify the whole thing, you go up to the setup, and you click on simulate. Now let's try to verify the whole thing and we'll see if it comes out the way we want it to. It'll do the pocket, then the outside edge, and then it'll come down and do the outside edge. And that looks pretty good. Uh, the one thing that you want to check also is make sure that there aren't any spots that it missed because of the tool. For instance, if this inside radius was uh, less than one quarter of an inch, this tool would not hit it, and it would show you in red or a different color that, hey, I didn't, uh, I didn't get it, I didn't get machined here, or any place that the tool couldn't go, um, it would show you in relief so that you know you'd have to go in and clean it up with a different tool. And then what would you do, what could you do if this was leaving some stock in these corners? If I had a really shallow eighth inch radius in there, what could I do to fix that? Any ideas? Uh, redesign the part or use a smaller bit. Redesign the part or good, good. And that's what kids will do. They'll they'll take this tool out and they'll go back to um, they'll go back to the 2D pocket and they'll change it to a quarter inch end mill. Um, and then it'll they'll look at the time and they'll say, Holy crap, it doubled the time that it takes to machine my part. Now it won't work because Mr. Hertz said it has to take less than six minutes. So then what they figure out is, oh, I can use, I can hog that out with a half inch end mill, and then I can go and I can do a 2D contour on the same thing around that outside edge with a quarter inch end mill only. So I'm doing another operation, I'm doing a tool change, but if that's what the customer wants, 
um, then so be it. That's what I have to do. And now what it'll do is it will, I can take that contour and drag it up underneath the first pocket. So when I simulate it, it'll do the pocket and then it'll drag a quarter inch drag the quarter inch uh, mill around it one time and took care of the the outside edge so there there's a, a solution to a problem too I didn't have that problem in this part but that's that's one way to do it go about it and the hardest well I'm not going to say the hardest part but once you get one of the sides done I like to get your kids used to um, going in and in renaming these what they actually are uh, that's the pocket in the top that's actually the lip of my lid oh actually it's not that's the pocket also and this one it just by clicking on it double clicking on it, I can rename them uh, this act actually is the lip and this is the outside of the box and I have kids do that so that as when I go around or when they turn it in, I can see what it's doing first, uh, what it's doing second, and what order about the order of operations are, uh, just so I can get an idea. I can click on Setup now and say, uh, where is it? Can I, do, I can't do time? Hmm. I was hoping I'd be able to check time from here. Let's try that. No. I guess I can only do it for each of the different uh, hmm. well okay we'll go back to that anyway but I've got I think all there's some way to get the total time after you run the simulate there there is I just don't remember where where it is and we'll get that in a second too but the the hard the the, the next step in this whole process is to take all of these different machining operations and uh, post processes. So if I choose my uh, whole box and I say post process it, I'm actually going to make sure that I've got the IntelliTech project lead the way V3 post. If you're not using the V3 post, you might end up with errors. So what you're going to want to do is make sure. Uh oh. My internet's getting a little slow. You're going to want to make sure you go to uh, the website and make sure that you download the post processor from here because it'll have the right one. And the video, the short video, will show you where to put it as well. Make sure you get the, the right post. I'm going to tell it I don't want it to save it there, desktop. I want to save it. Yeah, I do. I'll save it right in there and we're going to call this the bottom. And uh, sorry, wanted to open that folder and then I wanted to name it the Annika bottom. I said first try with HSM post it and then once you hit the post button it's going to ask you where do you want to save it. I want to save it in the right place obviously <laughs> let's go with the desktop for now I, my computer seems to be slowing down uh oh come on you can do it Jim would yell at me for using a Mac he'd, he'd say that's why the why we're having this issue not at all <laughs> that's not why you're having the issue no I might have something to do with the 24 inches of snow and my lack of decent internet. That could have something to do with it. And then basically what ends up happening, come on, as you can see I've got, holy cow, it produces the code for you. And this is the GNM code that you would then import into uh, CNC motion 
and I've already done it. I brought the, I just brought it into CNC Motion. I went to verify, verify my program. It starts out with that. It says insert tool seven now. Oh, you know what? And then it just goes through and it does the whole part for me. And if it works here, it's going to go work on. It's going to work on your IntelliTech machine. And notice though that I ran out of box back here. It's because I make my boxes bigger than uh, the stock allows in here. It's my box is really four and a half inches big on my verify window, but it will only let me go up to four in my verify window. It works fine on the milling machine. So um, that's the whole process from from once for one side. I can now go and machine my part as many times as I want. I can also come over here and say program estimate runtime, and it'll estimate the runtime. It's going to take me nine minutes to make this one side of the container. So that's not bad. That's not bad. I'll take that. And th so you think about that. I have 80, 86 minute periods. I can crank out, you know, 86 divided by 9. I can probably get 8 or 9 parts per period. Uh, and the same for the tops on the other machine because I have two milling machines. So I can make 8 or 9 boxes every day, you know. And so for a class, I'd be done in two class periods. That to me is kind of realistic. Then poof, you're done. You get to go on to the next project and do another project. It keeps the kids hopping, and they kind of they, they like it that way. At least they tell me they do. Um, I, I just wanted to throw out when I did the um, engraving, I, it was tool 11, and my IntelliTech did not like that, and I had to go back and edit the code and just tell it some other tool number. Really? And it ran fine. You know what yeah. you can do? You go into your tools. Um, and you say okay. set up library and you go down to tool 11 and I won't have a tool 11 like here's tool 11 okay. you click on tool 11 tell it what what uh, what is tool 11 do you remember let's see um, let's go okay. into the library and see what tool 11 is as a point one tapered, uh, oh, that's the engraver. So I'm going to say cancel. That's the engraver. So I would have to go into CNC Motion and make this an engraver. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to lie to it, and I'm going to call it an end mill, and I'm going to make it a point zero zero five. Uh, 0.05, a teeny tiny end mill, let's call it, um, and call it engraver, say apply, okay, now when it calls out tool 11, it has a tool to use, it might not look, okay. exa it might not look exactly like the engraver, but it'll work, right, and if you, if you know what the depth is, you can make that the proper width, that tool the proper width, and it will look exactly like you want it to, if you know what the, the width is at the depth. And you can fiddle with that on the actual machine, cut a slot with it, and then measure it at whatever depth you're cutting it at. You can say, okay, make that end mill this wide, and what you see on your screen will be pretty much what you get on the part. Make sense? Yeah, it does. I wasn't really too worried about the about it looking right on right. the screen. I was just making sure it fit in the yeah. block. Like, yeah. that it wasn't going to run off the block or anything stupid like that. Right. So, right. And w once I confirmed that, I was like, well, let's just go run it and see what uh -huh. it looks like in the wax. So. Awesome. Very cool. That's that's great. I'm glad you did that. Send us a picture so we can see it. We'd love to see it. And the, the neat part about this, we're running out of time here. I want to give you some time for uh, questions. But the neat part about this is, okay, I've done my top. I've produced my code, I'm sorry, I've done the bottom, I've produced my code for the bottom. Um, I can now rotate this around, flip this over, and do another setup on it, and choose, say, this corner for my setup. Um, and I can't, although I might as well, while I'm here, I'll go through the whole process. Let's uh, change this to select uh, Z and X axes. 
the Z is the right axis, but we got to flip it. And the X axis is this, oops. No, that's not what I wanted. Z axis is this. Flip it the other way. And the X axis is this. Flip it the other way. And once I get this all set up and I'm good to go, I say OK. Here's my second setup. And I can go in here and I can call this top. And this is bottom. And this is so much cooler because I can now, oops, yeah, whatever. So I can't spell today either. So now I can do the bottom and the top in one file. This used to be a nightmare in EdgeCam. You used to have a bottom file and a top file and a bottom NC file and a top NC file. And it never worked the first time. So you have bottom two and bottom three and it was a nightmare. This way it's all one and you can choose what to post process by clicking on it, right clicking and say which one I want to post process. Or I can select both of them, post process them at the same time, put a remark and a tool change. And so when it gets done with the bottom, make a remark that says flip the box, pull the box out, flip it over and it'll start the top. I'm not going to go that far this year. I don't, I, I do tops on one machine, bottoms on the other. And, uh, don't mix them up. Don't get them doing too crazy things, and the kids do fine. But it's it seems to be real simple. I'm loving it. I can't wait to do it next week now. Now, um, one thing I did want to show you is the difference between, uh, so I'm in the top. Um, I started playing, too, with this, what they call 2D Adaptive. So it's kind of roughing, but it's Inventors. It's HSM's own version of roughing and let's just rough this pocket and I'm going to do it in one pass just so that you can see what it does and we're going to let it use the half inch end mill we're going to say okay uh, watch when we simulate this now so before it used to when it did a pocket it would do it in uh, such a fashion that it would go around and around and around and around and around until it was all done um, with this HSM has figured out that they only want so much tool on the material at any given time. So this 2D adaptive, I guess, is what everything's going to in industry. It does it differently. And it does it this way because it's better for the tools. It's better for the materials. And you'll see that it's just a whole different strategy of how it does it. And I got to be honest with you, when I click on that 2D adaptive and it tells me how long it takes to machine that and if it takes less time than the way I did it before for me in my classroom time is everything so um, I show the kids I'm going to show the kids too that there's the 2D adaptive that you can use also when you get into surfaces you're going to talk about 3D milling uh, parallel laces and such but we'll get to that next week and, and the week after when we do some really crazy stuff but most of the uh, most of the containers that I gave you today, 2D pockets, 2D contours, and 2D adapters will do everything. I could do this whole thing with pockets if I wanted. It was unbelievably it was unbelievable how easy that was to to machine that in HSM. Um, and I just wanted to show you real quick if I think my my internet's going a little bit faster now. The uh, all of the tutorials uh, and you said you've done them all, right, Nate? Or you've done most of them? If if you come the very across very last one. Okay, if you come across any errors or something that could be better, please let us know. Give us feedback and we'll fix it. We'll change it up. Yeah, I emailed Jim about one thing that uh, I couldn't get to work right, and I didn't catch it wasn't working right in the video either, and he okay. went back and looked at it. And All right. So yes. we'll, we'll, we'll get that. We'll fix that too. Um, <laughs> there are no downloads yet. There could, there's, we're going to come up with a uh, paper version of this because some people like to see the, the list in front of them. Um, but you can download the post processor in the tool store right here. This video shows you how to install it. All of the inventor files that you see in all the videos are right here. And I just gave you a whole bunch of boxes, a whole bunch of containers uh, to play around with. So that'll give you something to do for a week. Yeah, anybody have any questions? I don't. No? 
Paul. The, uh, right. Yeah, go ahead. So have you used any? Have y'all used any reverse uh, imaging um, on any uh, plastics or anything with the engraver? I do it in the uh, uh, with a laser cutter. With a laser cutter. Yep. How did, how did they come out? Awesome. They come out. They they come out very well. It engraves the black and leaves the white. So I tell the kids, you give me a black and white image and we can engrave it. The next time we meet, I'll show you some of the uh, projects that the kids did. They're working on a, a light up sign project right now. Well, that's one of the kids said something about a, a light up sign and I was one and that was exactly where I was going with that. <laughs> I was like, that actually sounds like a good idea. Kaz High School pages. This the stuff is on the Chris and Jim Sim page too. That's our next EDD project, the hovercraft golf cart. Um, there's our new robot. So here's the here's the project. I don't know if you can see it very well. There's a video. So if you take a look, you see how it's changing colors. That base was made on the CNC machine. The base is made on the CNC machine, and that was engraved on the laser cutter. So that was the negative. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And you, we stuck a strip of LED lights in there. And see, Jim's class, Jim came up with this idea. But I do what I do best, and that's one-up Jim. So I actually yeah. see that little IR light right there? Oh, my uh -huh. kids have a, an infrared remote control. So they can <laughs> remote control theirs. <laughs> Plus, I had a grant. To, to purchase the remote controls, but um, the kids loved it. It was a great project. If you look in the background, you see all the bases, and you see how this edge was done with a uh, ball end mill. We ran a ball end mill around there, cut a slot in the top for the piece of plexiglass. The bottom has a big pocket, and it's all hollow. All the electronics get stuff, stuffed up inside. And it, it was such a time suck that I have, like, six kids who spend two to three periods a day assembling them because it wasn't nearly as easy as we thought it was going to be to assemble them. So everybody in class got a chance to run through an assembly process, but then these five guys in the background for pizza are putting them all together for all the kids because it was just taking oh, wow. way, way too much time. But that's that's this year's project. And But I, I keep the CNC really simple because there's my mill in the back. I only have two mills. Um, and they're little ones, you know, so you got to keep the kids busy doing something. And the kids designed this. This was the design that everybody chose as the best design for the base. And that was our project. So I, I guess it is a container in that it contains the electronics. Um, and they get to use the engraver, and they get to engrave anything they want on it, um, as long as it's G-rated. And that was, that was our project this year. I had a blast. It was fun. And I'll show you some pictures of their, we're starting to engrave their, their signs now. So I'll show you some of the things that they came up with next time we meet. All right. Cool. So good to meet. any questions? I held you three minutes long. Sorry about that. I think what we have in mind for next time is oh. surfaces and anything else in 3D. And then we're going to go right into robotics. But go ahead, Nate. You got a question? Oh, yeah, I just I sent you a couple of emails. I didn't know if you had gotten them, so I just wanted to confirm where I should be sending emails. Um, do you do it through uh, through the LMS? I almost said the HMS. You send uh, them through? No, I didn't. Okay. If you send them through there, it goes to every email I own. <laughs> okay. Um, and you're right. I don't remember getting an email from you, or it's uh, Chris at chrisandjimsim.com. That's where I thought I sent it, so I don't know why I didn't get to you. Hmm. Um, send it. Send it through here, and I'll get it there for sure. And okay. I'll I'll try to figure out why not. Yeah, because uh, I'm. Yeah, Chris. Yeah, Chris dot heard at chrisandjim.com. Chrisandjimsim.com. Correct. And Correct. then. Yeah, that's yeah. where I went. All right, send it through here, and we'll see what happens. What 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 was the question? Right. I can answer it now if you want. Um, it was really just it was about um, 
and getting a manual vice for the IntelliTech. And uh, I've kind of looked and found a couple of things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, I guess the IntelliTech has a 100-pound limit, and so I've been trying to find vices that are well under that. Um, but otherwise, I don't really know. I don't know. Um, um, so you're looking for, sure what for I should be getting. ask Jim for a, uh, he will give you probably the part number at, um, cause this is the, this is the, the type of vice that he has on his milling machine okay. at school. It's, I have one like this and I got to be honest okay. with you, it's very inexpensive, but it's not really accurate. The jaws kind of move a little bit. Okay. But, got to be honest for what I do it works just fine but like I said it's, right. if I had it to do over again I would go I would pay 160 200 bucks to get one of these vices and it's going to be probably one of the better investments you've ever made um, it okay cool so I should really just well. email him and ask him Definitely. for a recommendation send it through the okay. LMS to both of us and okay. Then, uh, okay I know we'll get it and I'll figure out why we're not getting it all right all right, well, I got to go. Thanks, okay. guys. Hey, no problem. Have a great night, guys.